Well, in today's rapidly evolving technological world, is our future in big data or in big compute? Well, to, in order to answer that question, let's first take a look at what I mean by big data and big compute. And I'll start with big compute. So, in this picture, what you see is Hokey Speed. This is a big compute resource. It is a supercomputer that I built here at Virginia Tech, and it debuted as the most energy efficient commodity supercomputer in the United States. So, what makes this supercomputer a big compute resource? Well, its size and its speed. In terms of its speed, it can calculate 500 trillion operations per second. To put that into context, that's 100,000 times faster than your typical PC. And in terms of its size, just to give you an idea of how big big compute is, it's about eight telephone booths worth. For those of you that remember what a telephone booth is. <laughs> okay. So what do we use these big compute resources for? Well, we're using big compute resources like Hokey Speed in order to do uh, epidemiological simulations. We want to study the spread of epidemics in large-scale social networks. And why is that important? Well, this is used oftentimes to guide public policy when outbreaks occur, such as West Nile virus, or more recently, the outbreak of polio in Syria that just happened earlier this week. By doing these simulations and understanding the spread of these viruses, we may then be able to shape public policy in terms of how to manage and contain the spread of the viruses. Another application that we run in a, on these big compute resources is a project that uh, is seeking to look towards reverse engineering the brain, which is one of the grand challenges of the National Academy of Engineering. In this case, we're trying to find repeating patterns of higher order motor function in EEG readings, EEG brain readings. The idea here is that, well, if we can understand the neurological pathways enough that we can provide proper diagnosis and treatment, and we can do this in simulation, we've gone a long way toward uh, helping society. So think of it this way. Uh, one, one of the neurological ailments that uh, is in the news today is something called CTE. What is CTE? Well, it's a progressive degenerative brain disease that is afflicting many athletes with a history of brain trauma, namely concussions. And we're seeing this in the NFL, the National Football League. So why is it so important? Well, we can only diagnose definitively, we can only definitively diagnose CTE after death. So one of the holy grails of neurology in this context is can we diagnose and treat CTE in living humans? So these are the kind of problems that we're solving. And if we did this on a PC, it might take weeks, it might take months, instead of hours and days that we can do it on a resource, a big compute resource like Hokey Speed. So what's big data? Well, this is a little bit facetious. Um, big data in this particular case, this is the Veterans Affairs backlog of files that are stacked so high that they pose a safety risk to the staff that are there. This is physical big data. Uh, this is data that has not been processed. It has not been mined for any type of insight or wisdom. It's just latent data that's just sitting there. Well, a little bit less facetiously, we think about big data. I, I, I did this on purpose to show you just in terms of volume so you can visualize big data. I'm going to look at something a little bit more abstract right now in terms of what I think big data is. Have you ever thought about the amount of data traffic that flows through the internet? So in 2013, the amount of data that flows to the internet was 667 exabytes. So you sit and scratch your head, it's like, what's an exabyte? That doesn't seem like that much. It's only 667 of these things. 
Well, it's a lot more data than you might think. It's 667 exabytes is equivalent to more than 141 billion DVDs. So if I were to take those DVDs, stack them up from here, about halfway up to the moon, that's how much data flows through the internet every year, or at least I should say in 2013. If I were to look at the printed text in the Library of Congress, I need over 33 million Library of Congresses to equal the amount of data that flows through the internet. All right, so I've talked about big compute and I've talked about big data. Right? And you say, like, ah, I still got this fuzzy notion of what this is. So think of it this way big compute and big data. Big data is your humongous haystack and the various algorithms that you use to root around that haystack. Big compute is your metal, lots of metal detectors. They're your devices with which you're going to try and find all those little needles in the haystack of information that you can glean some insight and knowledge from. Now, of this data, what I think is very interesting, and we just found this out over the last few months, is that 40% of all that internet traffic is Google traffic. So, 40% of that traffic is Google traffic, and it's being mined every day in order to get information about yourself. And so, this is big business. Big data is big business. Okay. So, I've given you backdrop on big data and big compute. Why am I bringing this up? So, back in May 2013, I had the privilege of going to the White House, and I talked about uh, some of our research on DNA sequence search in the life sciences. And we're doing this work uh, for many application areas. Uh, one would include finding mutations uh, in, in genes, uh, I'm sorry, mutations in genomes, and maybe then we can uh, infer different pathways that are causing uh, cancer, and, and then we try and look for uh, ways or targets with which to address and treat that cancer. That's just one example. And so at this function in, in the White House, uh, there was clearly a focus on big data. Big compute, while it was important, was clearly secondary in interest. It was really about big data. Three weeks later, I had the, uh, the nice uh, juxtaposition of the fact that I was part of a U.S. delegation that went to China, and I found that the converse was true there. Here, we look at big data as being more important it's big, than big compute, in China, big compute is more important than big data. So much so that they created a supercomputer called Tianhe 2 that's 282 times faster than Hokie Speed and twice as fast as the fastest US supercomputer. And they view big data merely as an application area of big compute. Okay. So if you think about this, it's like, well, big data, big compute, which is it? And you think back to what I just said about Google, and it's like, oh, wait a minute. I do Google searches every day on all that data that's out there. I do it from my laptop. I do it from my smartphone. What do I need big compute for, right? Well, in order to do that Google search, in order to find those needles in the haystack of information that get returned to your browser as Google search results, you're running that Google search on humongous big compute resources like the one you see in this picture here. What you see here up in the, uh, the left side of the diagram, you see two football-sized fields of compute resources. Okay. So which is it, big compute or big data? Well, 
Let me go through another brief example. People remember this? This is Watson versus two humans in Jeopardy. This is another example of big compute and big data. The big compute resource, Watson, it wasn't as small as uh, the two human contestants there. Behind it was a supercomputing resource on par of, with Hokey Speed. It's that big of big compute. And big data-wise, while it might not approach what we have on the internet in terms of 667 exabytes, it is uh, four terabytes of information that is being processed in order to answer the questions. So, what should we be investing in? Big data and big compute. Well, I, I think, or my hope is, is that I've convinced you that we should be investing in both big data and big compute. Um, in order to make sense of the data, we have to compute on the data. We have latent data sitting there. We need to compute on it to glean information out of it. From that information, we seek knowledge, whether or not the information is true, whether or not the information is false, what the quality of the information is. From the knowledge, we need to compute on that in order to generate insight and wisdom that then creates new data and new conclusions from which we have new data and we start the cycle again. So, I don't want to leave you with uh, that thought. I'm going to talk about one, one more thing related to big compute and big data, and that's your big data, your big data as a personal asset. Whether or not you know it or not consciously, just think about it. You have your data, your personal big data, as an asset that you freely give away every day. When you do, when you do various searches, when you go up on Netflix in this case, Netflix has mined your data to give you recommendations in terms of what you think, they think your uh, movie would be the most interesting to watch. Facebook does the same, off onto the right. There's ads placed, context-specific ads that are placed there that have mined your data profile in order to give you recommendations. So is this necessarily a good thing or a bad thing? It's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, many of you, including myself, view this as a convenience thing. Right? But what happens when that data is a lot more personal than something as innocuous as, as what you watch in movies and what you buy. What if that big data is your own genetic profile? Right now, in this graph, what you're seeing is that it cost $100 million to sequence, say, your human genome. You're back in 2001. Now, it only costs $5,700. If you go to 23andMe, you can get a kit for $99 to get your genome sequenced. So this onslaught of big compute and big data is here. The question is, is are you going to be empowered by it, or are you going to become a victim of it? And what do I mean by that? Well, Sergey Brin, who is the Google co-founder, had his genetic profile made up, and he found that he has a predilection to Parkinson's disease. So what has he done? Well, he's decided to pump hundreds of millions of dollars into Parkinson research <laughs> to proactively try and find a, a cure for Parkinson's disease, a treatment. But we're not all Sergey Brin, even though we might wish to be. <laughs> what if you had your genetic profile being done on a daily basis? It's as cheap as $10 a day, just to see how your genetic prof profile is, is progressing. And you found that you were, had a predilection to Parkinson's disease. Are you going to protect that data so that the insurance companies don't have access to it and jack up your premiums? Just think about that. And with that, I'm going to close.
With respect to big compute versus big data, are you going to be empowered by it? Or are you going to be a victim? Thank you.